singularity. Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of Singularity One on One. Singularity One on One is a podcast feature of Singularity Weblog where you can go and listen to it or download it in full. As you may already know, my name is Socrates, and as always, I am the man with the questions. Today, my guest on the show is Daniel Kraft. I met Daniel Kraft at Singularity University, where he is the head of the Future Med program, and he's one of those really fascinating people with a number of diverse accomplishments. He's a medical doctor, uh, chair of uh, the Future Med program at Singularity University. He's also an entrepreneur, an inventor, and an F-16 flight surgeon. So um, there's a lot of things that I would like to get Daniel to talk about today, but let's begin with your background. Um, how is it that you got involved with Singularity University? And uh, perhaps you can sort of trace the journey with all those diverse interests that you have. Well, how I ended up at Singularity University is certainly a journey and not anything that could have ever been planned. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll reverse back to high school. Uh, we most often start with our interests. I've always had an interest in um, sort of gadgets, being a boy, uh, uh, fun toys, uh, adventure, um, innovation. Uh, my grandfather and father were trained as engineers, though I'm not formally an engineer. Um, I was lucky to grow up near Washington, D.C. and uh, spent a summer after 10th grade at the National Institutes of Health, the NIH, and learned some early stages of how to be a basic scientist. And even though I was sort of mostly washing pipettes and, and uh, helping grow cells that first summer, I learned some good skills. And uh, to make a long story short, in 11th grade, we had to do a high school science fair project. I thought, ah, I'll go back to the NIH, uh, to the same lab. And I remember popping into my head an idea one day that we were that summer prior making antibodies to something called the IgE receptor, which is an important part of the uh, allergic response, and came up with an idea to use some of those antibodies to block the normal response. And in the end, that actually worked out beautifully. We showed for the first time you could block IgE-mediated histamine release and, and cure allergic disease in a test tube, and that won the science fair in the county, and I went to the international science fair and all sorts of awards. And it's like, wow, you can take an idea from concept to proof and even win a prize, and that was sort of fun. Um, the next year, went back and did it again. This time, we put it into animals and showed we can cure rats of their of their sort of hay fever type allergies. And so that had implications and won all sorts of awards again. That wasn't the main point. The main point is, wow, here's an idea of some science that could be applied and maybe turn into a solution. The downstream lesson was at that point, I thought, wow, maybe this could be used to cure or treat asthma. And back then, uh, uh, we weren't yet making humanized antibodies. They weren't yet in the clinic. So it was a good idea, but it's not clinical ready. We published it. I forgot about it. And then uh, 10 more, or more year, years later, when I was a medical student at Stanford, I was called by Genentech, a big pharma company. And they basically developed that same approach uh, to treat allergic disease, now a drug called Zolair. Um, and they were actually in a patent dispute with another company and asked me for my first paper. So to make a long story short, I got interested in science, the application of science to the clinic. Um, and I uh, learned that I probably should have filed some intellectual property and patents on those ideas. <laughs> now what I think is, you know, billion dollar plus drug. But um, it often takes a long time to go from idea to innovation to crossing that uh, clinical translation. Um, uh, other sort of things, so I went off to college, to Brown University. Um, I followed other passions. I was interested in flying since I was a little kid. I actually was at the Apollo 17 launch when I was a little youngster. Um, I learned to fly. They had a fr flying club there. It was $20 an hour, including gas to fly planes. I, I pursued lots of fun uh, extracurriculars. Brown was a good place to ha have a sort of open curriculum, uh, including uh, looking at the clinical side of medicine. I became an ambulance uh, sort of paramedic, an EMT, and so I got to help uh, uh, be in charge of an ambulance crew and run around campus and mostly take care of drunken induced uh, injuries. But it was a good opportunity to see what it was like to be a physician or take care of folks in, in the clinical area. So I uh, was melding the interests of uh, aviation, emergency medicine. I was doing a degree in biochemistry. I went back and spent time at the NIH. So um, that being said, uh, to answer your question, got interested in medicine, got interested in technology, innovation, invention. Um, left Stanford, went to medical school, 
I left Brown, was lucky to go to medical school at Stanford, which, like Brown, was also a pretty open, flexible uh, place. And I would urge folks earlier in their careers to try and go to educational institutions, which have some flexibility. It's great to take the classes and do well in those, but places like Brown, Stanford, other folks, arenas have so many other places and people to interact with. When you can mix it up, that's important. And to that point, my first year at Stanford Medical School, I ended up being the only non-engineer taking a class called Space Systems Engineering, so <laughs> still following my space passion. Uh, I helped design missions to Mars. We were then working with the Soviets to date this. And uh, we had Soviet engineers, we had Stanford engineers. I had to do all the life sciences. How do we get from Earth to Mars and back and keep people healthy? Do we have artificial gravity? What's the life support? Do we send a doctor? Uh, and that was a great multidisciplinary experience. Um, and as fate would have it, one day I opened up the Stanford newspaper and there was a little advertisement for International Space University, ISU. And it was going to be in Moscow that year. And I thought, wow, first year after medical school, after first year medical school, where else would be fun to go join the life sciences department, have a chair of the department who was a physician cosmonaut, and uh, mix it up with other folks. And uh, ended up going to International Space University that summer, which ended up being moved to Toulouse, France. And as some of your viewers might know, ISU was co-founded by Peter Diamandis, who was also the co-founder of Singularity University. So I had an amazing experience in that 10 weeks or so in Toulouse, France. We designed a mission to Mars, which um, from the political side, the medical side, the space physics side, and it was a great experience to that degree. And thinking about big problems, big challenges, multi multidisciplinary approaches, both in the medical policy, ethics, other side of things, and met an amazing group of other kind of crazy thinkers and a community. And to sort of answer your question, years later, I stayed in touch with Peter Diamandis and many folks from ISU. I spent time meeting many of them at uh, John Johnson Space Center and having lots of interesting adventures. I later met folks who, there who were flight surgeons in the Air National Guard and Air Force, and I went and did that. So I got experience being a, uh, a doctor for pilots in an F-15 squadron at Cape Cod and then elsewhere. And that was sort of how that world pursued. I was pursuing my interest in science, innovation, space, wanting to be an astronaut, those things. And interesting things happened, including meeting Peter and other folks from that organization. And several years ago, I was lucky to be attending the TED conference, reconnected with Peter. And when, I, uh, when Singularity University was being started about three and a half years ago, Peter asked me to get involved and help uh, chair and push the medical neuroscience side of the track. So no, nothing that could have ever been predicted, but sort of by following interests and uh, ability to mix it up with people, particularly from other realms. So ISU was a good example of meeting people who are not medical, mostly, uh, and getting inspired and connected and working with them uh, and staying connected to the sort of larger world outside of my more narrow medicine bucket. Uh, I was able to sort of stay interestingly connected and feel very fortunate to have uh, had my opportunity to uh, work with the folks at Singularity U and, and all the folks and students and faculty connected to it. That's a, that's a fascinating jury, uh, journey, Daniel. Uh, so let me ask you this then. So it seems that you, your original interest was in becoming a pilot. You said ever since you were a kid, you dreamed of flying, uh, you dreamt of flying planes. Then you sort of got interested in science, which eventually led you to medicine. So if you are to, and then you became an entrepreneur and so on, uh, you had your invention for harvesting bone marrow. Uh, how would you qualify yourself then? Are you, are you uh, a, a doctor first? Uh, are you a scientist? Are you a pilot? Are you an entrepreneur, um, a singularitarian? Well, I think we all can get wrapped up in these I am's, I am this, I am that. Uh, if we're going to stick on the, the pure definition, yeah, I'm, I'm a physician. I did the full medical school at Stanford, plus extra research and time. Uh, went off to Harvard and was lucky to do a combined residency in both internal medicine and pediatrics. And that was a big challenge for me in that I liked everything in medical school. I loved surgery, I loved psychiatry even, I loved emergency medicine, orthopedics. Uh, it was difficult to me for me to pick one sort of area because I was always inspired by multiple fields and the thought of only doing laparoscopic cholecystectomies or uh, <laughs> even you know bypass surgeries or anything every single day and it didn't exactly appeal to me. So, And I would also like, especially as a medical student or a resident, you spend a month doing one thing at a time and you can often bring beginner's mind to that. You see things from a new perspective each time, each month. It's fresh. It's fun. 
So anyway, uh, completed medical school, did the full, both combined residency. It was four years at Mass General and Boston Children's in internal medicine and pediatrics. Uh, came back here to Hotel California for fellowships at Stanford in hematology, oncology, uh, and pediatrics mostly. Uh, and then I did a fellowship in bone marrow transplantation, which is really a form of stem cell transplantation. So I, my time at Harvard, prior at Stanford, and back at Stanford, stayed very connected to the stem cell and regenerative medicine world, which is where I sort of wanted to meld the world of clinical work um, and innovation and science. I never wanted to be a full, full-on full doctor, seeing patients every 10 or 15 minutes, because I, I didn't think that would meet my sort of need for I don't know, creativity and innovation. Um, but uh, being back at Stanford in this very rich entrepreneurial environment, the Central Road, with the engineering school, the business school, the law school, all here, created a nice uh, niche for that as well. So while doing my standard medical training fellowships, I was part of the first year of the Stanford Biodesign Program. And Stanford Biodesign was a very unique program, now being expanded and um, kind of cloned across the world and other places that asked three things. This is important in any field. You know, what is really the unmet need and uh, in, a, in a clinical problem, the medical world, for example, and I'll, I'll, sh- I'll show you with you my unmet need and I'll tell you how that evolved, but first clearly editing, what's the real problem? Not, not having a technology and trying to apply that to the problem, but seeing really understanding the problem. Who's doing it? Who adapts this, the new tool or the toy or the app uh, or, the, or the device? Understand that really well, then innovating a solution and then getting it out there in the world. So um, my end might need as a bone marrow transplant fellow was how to do a better bone marrow harvest. I spent a lot of time in the operating room. We basically take a big needle trocar about this size and poke it into the bone marrow cavity several hundred times in our general anesthesia to get about a liter of bone marrow used for bone marrow transplantation. You can see a short TED talk on that if you, if you like a better description. I ended up thinking of a better way to do that, innovated and invented a device called the marrow miner, which really eventually got through FDA and CE mark uh, trials, and hopefully we'll get to the actual clinical market soon. It's a better way to harvest bone marrow stem cells, not just for bone marrow transplantation, a form of stem cell therapy we've been doing for 40 years, but also for a whole slew of regenerative medicine applications, which in some cases are using adult stem cells from the bone marrow or other places. So biodesign was a good example. So what else am I? So I'm a physician. I've been a scientist. spent a lot of time in the laboratory at Stanford and other places looking at mostly adult stem cells, how they develop their niche. Um, we published in Science a year or two ago a way to create sort of an artificial bone marrow underneath the kidney capsule and grow a complete bone marrow environment, discover the cells that would create that niche together with Charles Chan and other colleagues at Stanford. We developed another technique, technique to use antibodies, not for treating allergies, but to knock out the normal stem cells or the diseased stem cells so we could replace those with healthy stem cells, which has applications in longevity therapy, for example. Um, so been a physician, Spent a lot of time treating patients. Um, also, like the overlap with the research side, um, and also the entrepreneurial side. Often, there's a it's difficult to innovate um, in the academic world as much. Stanford is a reasonably healthy place for that. Um, and then, sort of, was blessed to get that sort of side gig at Singularity University over the first couple of summers, guiding the medicine track, um, from which our newer program, Future Med, emerged. <laughs>